Welcome to Lacrosse Classified on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network, presented by Extreme Threads. Your home for the latest news from the National Lacrosse League and Indoor Lacrosse. Now, let's talk some lacrosse with your hosts, Jake Elliott and Evan Schemenauer. What is going on, lacrosse fans? Welcome back to Extreme Threads Lacrosse Classified right here on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network where we grow the game one podcast at a time. It's Jake Elliott. It's Evan Schemenauer back with you. Week 14 in the National Lacrosse League coming up. A big week 13 in the rear view mirror. It wasn't a great week for me. We'll discuss that here momentarily. Evan, welcome back to the podcast. And it was a fabulous week for me, undefeated two weeks in a row. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I'll say this. It was a tough week for me, a great week for you. But if there was ever a good week to host Stampede Tax, who you got, uh, it's got to be this week because there's six big games here in week 14 coming up. Uh, we'll get to who we had here momentarily, but... Evan, right off the top, uh, trade deadline has just come and gone in the National Lacrosse League, and there was a total of six deals moved up um, in the coming days or the leading up to the deadline. And the Rochester Nighthawks involved in every single one of them. I don't know if I've ever seen a trade deadline quite like this year. But good on the Rochester for doing it. I mean, they are odds of making the playoffs for you know, declining every game. The chances are they're not making it. They got a bunch of uh, players that are getting older. They can start to trade, get some, uh, you know, assets in the future. Good on them. You know, Philly, they said they made their trades earlier on. Uh, They didn't make any moves. I was expecting them to try something. Um, And another surprise for me, honestly, Vancouver Warriors didn't make a single move. Yeah, I was a little surprised Vancouver did not make a move. And, and I know they don't want to, you know, sacrifice any draft picks um, for the future. But I thought there was a couple of bodies that maybe other teams would have been interested in that they could have got some draft picks back for. Um, but they probably also still feel a little bit like with the way the Colorado Mammoth are going right now, they got a good shot to make the playoffs and uh, a big home and home coming up with the Mammoth. That's really kind of going to determine that fourth and final playoff spot in the West. So. Um, two schools of thought there. They stood pat, um, but let's run through them quickly here. I guess we'll start with the biggest deal, and that was probably the oldest deal, and that was Joe Reziteritz going from the Nighthawks to the Black Wolves in a first-round draft pick involved there. Lucky enough for me, just as I was wrapping up my NLL flash uh, for the week, this one actually popped on, so uh, back to the flash to analyze it. Simple fact, Callum Crawford probably going to get suspended for some length this week. We don't know how much, but Joe Rezaterich fills that void because the entire offense in New England goes through Callum Crawford. So they needed something to replace that. Um, He's a rental, so a first and a second, a little steep, although if he goes somewhere else, you probably get the first pick back in compensatory picks and for those that don't understand this yeah, if you I'm lose probably a free one agent, of them Evan <laughs> if you lose a free agent yeah you get a bonus pick at the end of a certain round and the league determines what that pick is or in yeah, you know for that, example Mike Poole and it was two picks um that's the part it, I don't get Evan is that who at the league office is determining what that player is worth as far as draft picks go. Is it a committee? Is it a single person? Is there like some sort of a chart or a graph on how they determine what a player's value is worth? That's the part I don't get. Like losing a free agent, that should be part of sports, really, to me. Like you lose a free agent, well, you should have probably tried harder to keep your free agent in your stable, to me. I don't know why you're getting compensatory picks. And then if you're going to get compensatory picks... How do you decide what that pick is worth? Like, it, none of it makes sense to me. Evan, um, let's move on. So, Reza Terrence to the Black Wolves, 
Rochester gets a first and a second round pick, and uh, we'll see how that all plays out at the end of the year, whether Joey Rez decides to re-sign in New England. I think he might. Um, next up, uh, the Dawson brothers reunited in San Diego. Remember, Rochester involved in every deal here, folks, so I don't really need to say it, but Rochester, Paul Dawson to San Diego uh, as Paul and Dan back together again. Once again, um, way for Rochester to start to get younger. This is something they started to push last year um, as they slowly started to release guys, trade guys away. You know, they traded away Dan Dawson last year. Um, you know, once again, the second-round pick, it works. I don't think the Seals will have any issues re-signing Paul Dawson. It looks like a good fit there. Rochester, they got a look to the future, why not get the pick and go ahead? Yeah, one thing fans are kind of saying in Rochester is that Kurt Styers is absolutely gutting this team on his way out the door and stocking up picks for his new team in Halifax and kind of leaving the cupboards bare. Uh, but he's, like, everything that he's doing, he's doing for the future. And I, and I get it in Rochester. There's going to be some pissed off people there. But let's not forget the impact that Kurt Styers has had on the Rochester Nighthawks. They wouldn't be there without Kurt Styers and, and some of the things that he's done there in Rochester to, to keep the fan base engaged. Um, yeah, again, there's no Nighthawks if there's no Kurt Styers, and I know this is kind of a, a tough situation with him looking to the future and, and kind of dismantling a, a team, a once proud team that won three straight NLL Cups. It's it's tough to watch as a, as a loyal Nighthawk fan, but... At the end of the day, all you got to do is look at the San Diego Seals, and you might get a better team next year uh, coming out of expansion if you do it right. Uh, by the way, I heard you mention Lacrosse Flash the other uh, earlier. They got a new website uh, up, so make sure you're checking that out. Uh, Patty Gregoire, Tyson Geick doing good work. Lacrosseflash.com, and uh, kind of kicking it old school a little bit there on the Flash. Uh, I like it. So check that out as well. As let's move along, and then maybe the most head scratching trade of the six here, Evan. It was a one for one deal, two unrestricted free agents, but one has like over three hundred points in his career. The other has over a thousand. Ryan Benesh for Corey Vitarelli, straight up between the Mammoth and the Cahawks. If you told me that it was Ryan Benesh for Corey Vitarelli and a second, I could justify this. I, I I can justify it for Rochester in a heartbeat. Both these guys are going to be unrestricted free agents, and they're both turning 34. The reason that's important, neither one can be franchised. They are free to go wherever they please. Now, if Banesh doesn't resign in with Halifax next year, okay, they're probably going to get a first-round draft pick for him. If it was Corey Vitarelli as the person that doesn't sign up for Rochester – is probably a second-round pick. That's a good exchange there for Rochester. Colorado, the only explanation I can come up with is they were trying to shake this offense up, and they tried hard to shot Jeremy Noble. They couldn't get a suitor for him. Yeah. You know, They're not going to trade Eli McLaughlin. They're not going to try trade Ryan Lee. They're not going to trade Kyle Killen. You're going to shake the offense up. The only option you got is Ryan Banesh. <laughs> but yeah, well, you're taking away your top score. No, Why? I hear you. Well, the only thing, other thing that I can think, Evan, is that after the comments of Pat Coyle that I saw in New England after that game was that he was a little disappointed in his team that, that the inmates were kind of running the asylum a little bit. And I'm not pointing the finger at directly at Ryan Benesh, but maybe Benny was kind of doing his own thing out there. And this is a message to the rest of the offense saying, like, you don't play the system, you're not going to play in Colorado. So, I don't know if that's the case or not. That's pure speculation. I don't think Ryan Banesh has ever kind of been one to go off the grid and, and kind of do his own thing out there. But maybe that's a, a message sender there from Pat Coyle is that nobody is untouchable here and, and you better do things uh, the way I want or or you're gone. Um Speaking of gone, let's move on here. Three down, three to go. Next one, pretty straightforward deal here. I like this one for Rochester again here, Evan Schemenauer. 
Kayhawks pick up Chris Bushy from Calgary for just a fourth round pick here, and I think this is a kid that can make an impact on that Nighthawk roster, and they only have to surrender a fourth round pick. There was just no room for him in Calgary. They get a pick back, but fourth rounders do not make active rosters very often. A little surprised by this one, because Calgary does have some unrestricted free agents coming up this offseason, including Reese Dutch. Um, you know, and Kurt Malowski was very high up on Chris Bushy. I was very high up on Chris Bushy. I remember when he was He still can be, Evan. He still can be. Yeah, I mean, he's in Saskatchewan. I was disappointed there wasn't a spot for him here. To pick him up for a fourth round, this is a no-brainer. Yeah, oh, well, I agree, man. I agree. Uh, next trade, Colorado Mammoth involved again. Uh, they pick up veteran defender, maybe the best shot blocker in the National Lacrosse League, and Ian Lord. They give up Rowan Kelly, an up-and-coming American defenseman, and also a 2021 third-round pick. Um they need some veteran leadership and, and maybe some bolstering on defense, but I don't know. Like Colorado's issue is they can't score enough goals, but maybe if they just keep enough out of their net, uh, they'll have a chance to win some games. They go after a veteran of this league in Ian Lord. Colorado's going to have to hope to win some games 8-7 at this stage. Um, I, I would have looked for more help on offense, but I think once again, when there were no suitors for Noble, uh, Ian Lord was there. We do know that Colorado was in talks on Scott Campbell. They couldn't get him. Uh, so this was probably the second best option for Rochester. You get the young Rowan Kelly and, you know, once again, build that youth for the future. Try and build that team moving forward. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about Scott Campbell here in a sec. As far as Noble goes, like there's a lot of lot of opinion on Jeremy Noble and what is going on with him, what is wrong with Jeremy Noble. And I'm at a bit of a loss here as well, Evan. I, I don't see how a kid that is like a born winner, like this guy wins. He's a member of Team Canada, for goodness sake. And all of a sudden, he can't score goals. It leads me to believe he's got some sort of significant injury, and he's just trying to play through it. I don't know if that's the case or not, or whether his confidence has just gone right out the window. If I'm Pat Coyle, if I'm the Colorado Mammoth, i got to find a way to get Jeremy Noble through this and get his confidence back. And if he's injured, sit him down and let people know what he's been going through at the beginning of the year. And if he's not injured... And you can't get anything for him through a trade. The deadline is gone. You got to play Jeremy Noble through this and let him get out of his slump. Put him in positions to succeed, whether it's at the top of the power play or just double shift the kid every time out or whatever the case is. Let him work on the weak side with a two man game more often than not and get Jeremy Noble going because without Jeremy Noble, like the, Colorado is a solid team. Yeah. But without him, like they're going nowhere. So no. they, they got to figure it out. No, and the thing with Noble, I wouldn't have tried to trade him, and the reason being is you're getting, you're going to trade him away at a discount, much less than he's, in my opinion, he's really worth. Uh, you know, he's going through a slump. He'll he'll kick out of it someday. You know, you got to stick the course with him, and you know, you, if you can't possibly improve your team by dealing him away, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think the little duder will work his way out of it. I really do. I think he's got too much character to be satisfied with what's happening. And, and like I said, if he's injured, then maybe it's time to take a seat, get healthy, so you come back and, and you're right. Uh, final deal out of the six here, Evan. Um, and it involved the Saskatchewan Rush, and they go out, and for me, like I'm not just blowing smoke here because I'm a Rush announcer, but the Rush go out and get almost exactly what they need and that is another veteran defender that can run in transition that is going to fit in with that team that is going to know the system and man like they give up a second round pick and then another conditional and that conditional pick is if the rush win it all uh, they give up another second rounder so I think you're taking that deal as far as a condition goes but Scott Campbell now a member of the Saskatchewan Rush, he will play this Saturday against the Buffalo Bandits. If you had a condition that if you win it all, you got to give up another second, I don't think there's a single fan that's going to have an issue with that. No, I think you give up more than that. You probably give up a first if you're going to win another championship. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we heard that uh, with Campbell, the price tag that Rochester was asking was sky high. In the end, it looks like they took what they could get. I have zero issues with this because assuming that Campbell does sign somewhere, I, I don't expect he's going to sign in Saskatchewan again next year. I think he'll stay out east. But if he does, if he just all he does do is sign somewhere, the rush are getting that second rounder yeah. back. Well, so yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I <laughs> like I don't be surprised, Evan, if if Scott Campbell gets here, likes it, and and. By all accounts, most guys like it here because they win a lot. Don't be surprised if if a guy late in his career wants a chance at winning a couple more cups. I think you take that over being closer to home and having less travel. Like, you're 14 years into the league. What difference does it make? Like, you've been around the map enough. Um, it's about winning championships. And if, uh, if Scott Campbell likes in Saskatchewan – and they take another deep run here this year. Why wouldn't he re-sign with the Rush? So we'll see how that plays out as well. Evan, you forgot to remind me to tell the people who we have on Extreme <laughs> Lacrosse Classified oh once again. Yeah. We're 15 minutes into the program, and I'm just about to tell you who's on the show this week. The Phenom from the Calgary Roughnecks goaltender Christian Del Bianco will join us here in about 10 minutes' time. And then the color commentator, my former broadcast partner, my good buddy, Brad Challoner from the Vancouver Warriors, will join us uh, in about half an hour from now here on Lax Class. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. But as we continue on here, it's time to get in to Stampede Tax, who we had. Because Stampede Tech sponsors who we had, and they are your complete source for boots, hats, belts, jeans, and anything country. And as it stands right now, all things I will be wearing at the end of the NLL season should my losing streak <laughs> continue. They're located in Cloverdale since 1967. Shop online at stampede.ca, where shopping online is still shopping local. Um, tough week for me. I went 1-3. and three. Evan, you went 4-0. and oh. Uh, but let's get through it here. First game up was Buffalo at Philadelphia. And, man, could I feel any more sorry for the Wings? I'm not sure I could. A heartbreaker at the Wells Fargo Center in front of over 10,000 fans. 12-11 bandits in overtime. Chase Fraser. 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 With the overtime winner, Evan. Four goals for Chase Fraser, not Frazier. See where I'm going with that? Yep. Okay. And, uh, you know, Chase uh, had a, quite the goal celebration when he won in overtime, maybe a little too far. Nah. I'll guarantee he'll hear it again when he gets back to Philly next time. But, yeah. That's okay, because um, I think Chase Fraser feeds off of that sort of stuff. He's always been like that. He's never going to change, and I think that's what makes him the player that he is. Simple thing, and it's going to sound like a broken record. And when I looked at this, like, how do you analyze this game without saying the thing you said a hundred times already? Philly didn't play a 60 minute game. They didn't score in the last 20 minutes. And even when Philly was up 11, nine late with about three minutes ago, I wasn't sitting there thinking, you know, they got my it. God, Philly they... is going to win this. It was, how are they going to screw this up? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Sure if, enough. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they screwed it up. I think Buffalo is a really good team that took a long time to kind of get started in this game. But Philadelphia was literally in the lead for the entire contest until it came. Like they had to scrap and claw just to get it to overtime. Uh, Corey Small tying it late with about a minute to go, if I recall. But yeah, I yeah. Mean, you gotta you gotta learn how to close out games. If you're filled up, they could easily have a way better record than they do if they just could figure out how to close out games. First, they couldn't figure well, out how to start games, and now they can't figure out how to close them out. And one thing, the theme that you're going to see this week is rust coming off of bye weeks. Now, Buffalo didn't have the greatest night. Evans, 1 for 14 on shots. Smith, 1 for 12. Small, 2 for 11. There was a lot of rust there. Luckily, they had the opponent that they could beat that night. Yeah. But, you know, this is a recurring theme you're going to see throughout the week of teams on a bye week just not having it. 
That's uh, what you call foreshadowing right there from Evan Schemenauer as we move along here in who we had. Georgia was waiting in Buffalo for the Bandits on the back half of their back-to-back. And you brought up the point that maybe the Bandits should have started Zach Higgins in this game. And after you said it, I tend to agree after watching it, in front of over 15,000 in Banditland, Evan, uh, Stotts, Jackson, both with five points, but it was a real balanced attack here from the Swarm. And they win it pretty comfortably, 14-9. to nine. Yeah, Matt Vince just was not seeing the ball well, and that's a common theme when guys are playing back-to-back nights. Um, as much as Randy Stotts had four goals, no Swarm player actually had more than five points, so a big distribution of the ball. You didn't know where it was coming from. But I'm just not going to read too much into this game when you look at the teams at the top of the East because the circumstances dictate that Buffalo, a little bit tired coming off the game before, having to play an extra five minutes, not going to help. Georgia, nice and fresh, waiting for Buffalo up there. This was probably about to happen. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So uh, Buffalo drops a game for the first time in a while. Georgia with an impressive win. Next up, uh, our third of four games uh, in Week 13, and it was uh, another rematch here. This had to feel pretty good for one Steve Govett, for one Joshua Gross, as they take their San Diego Seals back into their old home in front of another crowd over 15,000 at the Pepsi Center, Evan. But San Diego continues to impress their tide the top of the Western standings at six and four with the rush with a 13, 10 win over Colorado, a super slow first half here for the mammoth, just two goals in that opening half. That's not going to get it done. Oh, for four on the power play Dawson and Billings, both with seven points, 13, 10, the final, I guess what do you expect when you trade away your top score (laughs) and you expect this offense to click right away, it's going to happen. I was a little happy that, you know, Eli McLaughlin at least got a six points on the night. I thought that with Banesh gone, they're going to target him a little more and his production might go down. It didn't. That's a good sign for Colorado. And Jeff Whitting, you know, yeah. <laughs> those goal celebrations were something else. But, <laughs> Unabashed but, jubilance there from Jeff Whitting. Yeah. But for San Diego, 13 goals, just 41 shots. It was the quality of shot they were getting. The Colorado defense, for the most part, uh, shutting down Austin Stotts. He only, only had two points on the night. But it was San Diego getting in transition, mm-hmm. getting inside. And when they had the shot, they were finding the back of the net almost every time. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, they, they outshot him. They outloose balled him. But they just can't score goals right now. And it's uh, it's a little perplexing. I mean, I think they're, they're a better team. But now, like, after that game, I kind of feel like maybe Colorado is just what they are. And they're in for a tough year here. So good on San Diego, though, man. Like, they continue to, to be impressive. And, uh, man, you can circle that that game on March 22nd down at Pachanga Arena, Rush coming to town uh, already with the the 1-0 lead in that season series. That is going to be a fun game on the 22nd down in San Diego a couple of weeks from now. One more game here, Evan, on Stempy Tex, who we had. And Toronto, coming off that bye week, go to Calgary in front of over 10,000 fans. But this one was all roughnecks. Uh, they jump out to an 8-3 lead at halftime. Doby scores the goal of the week. Curtis Dixon has a fight with Caputo. 5-7 uh, on the power play. Roughnecks were impressive after getting it handed to him a little bit. In Toontown a week ago, they bounced back with a nice, impressive win over the Toronto Rock, 15-9. to Yeah, uh, Calgary got out fast on this one. They were up 6-1 just a few minutes in the second. Nick Rose didn't have a great night, but neither did anybody in front of him. And if you listen to Matt Sawyer's uh, post game pro- uh, press conference, he just let people have it. He wasn't holding back. Uh, once again, Calgary, 15 goals, 44 shots, but they were getting quality transition opportunities, they're getting quality looks inside. Um, you know, Reese Dutch uh, lighting up for four, Pace and Lowen with hat tricks. Curtis Dixon, no goals, but eight assists and 
Uh, and a scrap. One and a scrap, that, Evan. Yeah. And, uh, well, you want to you know, make a, a comment on this? about it, whether the helmet should have come off or not. And he, Now, here's one thing to keep in mind. He got an instigator. And he got an instigator because he engaged in a fight with his opponent's helmet off and his on. This is this is what a, I believe it's eighty point eight in the rule book. Now, according to eighty point five, if he does this again any time this season, yeah, he gets suspended for it. So he's got to be careful. Here's here's my view on it, and a guy that that's been in a in a couple of lacrosse fights, Evan, uh, over my years, just a couple. I was always a guy that that took my helmet off to fight, just because I was mostly bigger than everybody, and it looked really bad if I didn't. Um, if I happen to get into a scrap where, you know, it was really spontaneous and, and my helmet, you know, I didn't have time to take my helmet off. If I got the other guy's helmet off, I would, you know, stop and take my own helmet off while I was fighting sort of thing. But in Curtis Dixon's situation where he felt Caputo took liberties on somebody and it deserved a response, Caputo kind of knew it was coming and started to go at Curtis Dixon. I think when they actually engaged with each other, both guys' helmets were on. Dixon definitely dropped his mitts first. Uh, no question about that. But I think he j- just was a little bit better at getting Caputo's helmet off than than Caputo was getting Dixon's off. And when you're in a fight like that and it kind of sparks quickly and you engage quickly... Could Curtis Dixon have taken his helmet off? I suppose, but the guy's a 50-goal scorer in this league and an absolute superstar, and probably, you know, I don't know how many fights he's been in. I want to say this is only his second, maybe third in his career. If I'm Curtis Dixon, I'm not, you know, I'm not living by the code here when it comes to fighting. It's not something he does very often, and, and stepping back and squaring off and taking off my bucket. Like, he was defending a teammate, and engaged quickly, and he got Caputo's helmet off. And I don't even know how many scoring blows were landed. Like, he threw some big shots, but I don't know if any of them really landed. And down to the turf they went. But I think it was a little excessive to give him an instigator in that uh, scenario. But we'll see if the league maybe looks at it and and uh, decides to, to change that, which they've been known to do. Speaking of changing things, um, we're still awaiting word on the Callum Crawford suspension. Hearing that an arbitrator should be ruling on this uh, either Wednesday or Thursday. Evan, you're under the assumption or the belief that you need a two-thirds vote uh, from the Board of Governors in order to potentially rescind this major which we discussed last week uh, that this is being entertained here by the league so we'll see how it uh, plays out here with Cal no. Crawford over the next oh you're gonna correct me okay well, you, it's not, not quite that no okay now if the arbitrator is ruling and I can't see how he changes it because the precedent's there the rule book is there um, and it was rewritten to be clear as to the six games. What I'm hearing through the chain is that New England requested a rule change mm. to 41.4 to reduce the number of games for the repeat offender. That's what requires a two-thirds vote from the Board of Governors okay. to change that rule mid-season. If that happens, then you could see the suspension reduced almost instantaneously. Yeah. Okay, well, that makes a little more sense, even though that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, I, changing rules in the middle of a season because of what happened to a certain player, again, I don't want to go off on a, on a tangent here again. Please don't do it. Please do not do it. Uh, it's a bad, bad look. Um, we got to get to break here, Evan. We got Christian. What? You got something else? But we but we got to remind the folks just where we are in the standings. Okay, here. yeah, yeah. I know you're trying to go, get away from this ahead. Too quickly. Go <laughs> ahead, quickly, quickly. Evan. <laughs> so once again, second straight week, I went four and zero. Oh, you went to lowly one and three, only getting the bandits right. So now the records. I'm at forty one and twenty, and you're at thirty nine and twenty two. Once again, thirty nine and twenty two would take the lead in most of these pickums. Mm. But in who you got, it is not good enough. Big week on deck here. Six games uh, for me to catch up. I, I want to be tied at the end of this week uh, is is my goal. 
So we'll see what happens there uh, coming up later in the show. But now we're going to break because we got Christian Del Bianco on the other side here on Extreme Threads Lacrosse Classified. Keep it locked right here on the Lux All Stars Podcast Network. Pure Vita Labs is proud to bring you the highest quality sports supplements on the market. PVL products are 100% all natural with no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners. And the entire line is also informed choice certified. We designed all our products with the athlete in mind. We look forward to being a part of your athletic achievements, helping you push the bar higher, win at the highest levels, and set personal records for years to come. Hey, this is Lyle Thompson, and you're listening to The Cross Classified on The Cross All Stars. All right, welcome back to Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. Big thanks to our friends at Pure Vital Labs. Anything else would be unsportsmanlike. You can find them at pvl.com or their social media at Pure Vita Labs. Why don't we start there, Phenom? Christian Del Bianco, join us here on the podcast. You are a PVL athlete. Um, what kind of products are you taking to help you recover, be ready for game day? Uh, why did you decide to go with PVL? Uh, obviously, they're an awesome company. They're based out of Poco. So, pretty awesome guys. Ryan Keller, he's a guy who worked with guys like Westberg and Tyler Pace. So, through them, I got hooked up with them. And obviously, it's great stuff. For me, I'm obviously not trying to get too huge. So, it's just kind of BCAs, game aids, glutamine, all that recovery stuff, just making sure I'm ready to go for game day. Absolutely, absolutely. They, uh, I know Evan. You, you've been, you've been taking some stuff too. Yeah, more for weight control and everything like that. But uh, yeah, I haven't been gaining, so I'm happy with the product so far. Right on. Uh, well, Christian, uh, big win over Toronto uh, last weekend. Um, you guys got off to a good start in that one, and then just kind of held serve in the second half there, but uh, good to be back home in the rough house and, and get a get a solid win over a very good Toronto team. Yeah, 100%, and I think that's just kind of the thing where we were obviously at that 5-6 and six record, and it's kind of that time of year where we're all battling for playoff spots, so it's nice to get that big win at home. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about the big fight. <laughs> obviously, you don't expect a guy like Curtis Dixon to drop the gloves, but it had to be a bit of a surprise and I guess a bit of a team building moment when he went after uh caputo there yeah obviously you know it's an emotional game but it is kind of pretty awesome seeing a guy like dix who that's ne- not necessarily as normal to be going out there and fighting but you know he stuck up for one of our teammates and obviously it got the crowd and all the boys fired up speaking of this christian as we speak with christian del bianco here speaking of fighting there was a fight a week ago or just over a week ago in Saskatchewan. And then there was kind of a timeout period. And I don't know if you've seen this or yet, not Delbs, but there's a video out there from between the benches after that scrap. And you and the Rush and, and the Roughnecks are all kind of face to face and a lot of chirping going on back and forth. Have you seen have you seen this video yet? Yeah, I've obviously I've seen the video, so So that's just, just- yeah, no, I, I I just want to preface this a little a little bit here before before I get your response because when I watch you play, like you're a guy that always kind of gives the goalie a, a tap on the gloves. You're you know you help guys up when they fall down in your crease. But then I kind of saw the other side of Christian Del Bianco a little bit, where I saw the fire in your eyes and there was some chirping going on. Is that is that something that's just kind of towards the rush, or is that something that's in your DNA and and helps you play better? I think that's just kind of a heat in the moment thing, right? I think once again I'm kind of saying the same thing, but it's an emotional game, right? So I think a lot of times you do want to be even keel, but there's always going to be those times here and there where maybe you just get a little fired up, and I think it's okay to show emotion as long as it's controlled emotion. I think back earlier this year we had uh, Kurt Malowski on the program, and the one interesting thing he said during that interview was that the one thing he does not worry about on, on the Roughnecks is you. That's got to be a heck of a confidence booster that, your head coach isn't worried, and he's just going to let you do what you need to do. Yeah, obviously it's huge, right? And I think me and Kurt have kind of built this really great relationship here where we kind of know and trust each other. I think just working on how we communicate and understanding, like, the game plan, all of that, knowing when to throw the deep ball, when to kind of hold it back has been a huge learning curve for me. 
so he's definitely helped me along with that. Speaking with Christian Del Bianco and and your backup in Tyler Richards is is kind of a unique situation there, Christian, because T has been a guy that you really kind of grew up watching and, and idolizing and wanting to be like, and both Coquitlam guys, but now you're the starter and he's the backup, but you're still learning from Tyler Richards, and that's got to be a real kind of a, I don't know, a, I don't know, a security blanket or an insulator to have a guy like that that's going to help mentor you even though you're already the starter. It's unbelievable, right? And kind of like the thing that people forget sometimes is how T was – arguably the top goalie in lacrosse for a couple of years there. So it's just kind of, there's nothing that I'm going through that he hasn't been through before. So just having a guy like that, to get his opinion, get his honest advice. It's, it's unbelievable. And he's become a great friend of mine and it's pretty exciting for a guy who grew up watching him. You had mentioned earlier, pushing the ball up the floor and uh, there's a great program this year where a sponsor stepped up. Every time you get an assist, it's 500 bucks to go to uh, kids' sports there in Calgary. Does that uh, ever motivate you to maybe push the ball a little more than you normally would? Or is it ever in the back of your mind when you're playing that, you know, you might want to get that assist when you have the opportunity? Um, as much as I would like to say yes, but it's no, right? It's kind of one of those things where my job is to win lacrosse games, not get assists. So I'm not trying to throw the deep ball. I'm just trying to save the ball kind of thing couple of more minutes here with goaltender from the Calgary Roughnecks, Christian Del Bianco, and, and some new faces on that back end with Reese Callies and uh, Eli Salama and um, Shane Simpson back there. Uh, that Roughneck defense has really kind of been revamped over the last couple of years, Christian. Who's who's impressed you, and, and what do you think the difference is being where you are at this point of the season now compared to where you were a year ago? I think, yeah, we have some of those young guys that kind of went through a bit of a learning curve at the start of the year, but the biggest thing with that is just the athletes that we have. We have a guy like Shane Simpson that is probably the fastest human I've ever seen play lacrosse. You <laughs> yeah. have Reese Callies, who's a giant, and then Eli, who's another guy who's just a freak in the gym. So they all have a pretty good understanding in lacrosse IQ. It's kind of the ceiling's extremely high for those three guys. Well, speaking of speed, one of the things that is always a treat for me when I watch you is if you've got to make it to the bench on a delay or you're pulling the goalie <laughs> late, you beat three or four of your teammates to the bench. Even you're wearing, what, 20, 30 pounds of equipment. How the heck do you manage to pull this off every time? Uh, it's kind of a joking matter around the team because, especially with the NFL comp, mind being around, I was kind of getting into and arguing with a couple of guys, arguing if I could run a five-second, 40-yard dash or not. So they seem to think that I'll be more in the 5-4 area. I think I'll be like the 4-9-9, but I kind of always bring that up when they're chirping me about it. One thing that's uh, a little different about you than most of the goalies in the NLL is your size. You know, most of the guys are big. They just occupy the net. For those goalies that are out there, those young goalies that are smaller in stature, what is the difference that you have to adjust to your game, uh, especially with the bigger net, uh, that other goaltenders don't necessarily have to do in their game? I think it's kind of lo- obviously a little more speed and a little more give and take and just having that understanding that you're not a bigger guy. But I think at the end of the day, the biggest thing is it doesn't matter how you stop the ball as long as you're stopping it, right? I don't think anybody cares if you're a blocker, if you're a fast guy, as long as you're saving it. That's pretty much it, hey Christian? Just like shut up and stop the ball, goalie. Like that's that's pretty much the what the message has been since the dawn of time. Well, exactly, right? And it's kind of <laughs> it's it's that easy, though, right? Like yeah. that's the thing. So yeah. sometimes it's like it's that simple, and sometimes it's that hard, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of finding your way to do it. It's the most difficult uh, position in the sport, no question about it. Uh, one more here for you, Christian Del Bianco. Uh, Number one overall draft pick in the WLA uh, a month ago or so, and you get picked to your hometown team, the Coquitlam Adnax. I see the Iceman, your former Calgary Roughneck team, and or current, just not with you right now, um, also signing with the Purple and Gold. What's that going to be like for you? I mean, you go from just an unbelievable junior career, two Minto Cups, uh, undefeated <laughs> through the regular season. But now you're going to be, like, in senior, and you're going to be facing guys that you played junior with and uh, a completely different team, although in the same uh, building and uniform. Uh, how excited are you for, for summer ball to get going? 
I'm um, said it's a it's a new challenge, right? Obviously, we have a guy like West coming back. He's another great leader and unbelievable across talent. And I think it's just about building, right? I think you're not you don't want to kind of say that. Well, we're going to win the Man Cup this year. It's kind of building and doing the little things that are going to make you successful and get you towards that end goal. Absolutely, man. Well, I look forward to, to watching you play on Saturday nights uh, on the, in the Palace there, and uh, we'll see you April 20th uh, in the Rough House when the Rush come to town. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Christian Del Bianco, 35, goaltender for the Calgary Roughnecks, uh, a man I like to call the phenom, Evan. And, and I was talking with... Um, Neil Harushka last night uh, about his son Lane and and kind of the path that he is on and and you know Christian's name came up and it was like you can't look at Del Bianco as somebody that you can compare yourself to because nobody has taken a path like Christian and nobody has had the success like he has had at the age that he is. It's incredible what he has accomplished so far in his lacrosse career and he's still what twenty two. You know, he's he's my favorite goaltender in the whole league to watch, and it's not even close. Here's the thing. We talked about guys needing to get to the 25, 26 to finally find their groove as a goaltender in the league, find their way. He was what he was my pick for goaltender of the year last year, and he was still eligible to play for the Minto. Yeah. That yeah. is unheard of. It's absolutely crazy. It'd be interesting to see when Team Canada's roster comes out whether Christian Del Bianco's name is on that list or not. Uh, we got to get to break. On the other side, it's the color commentator. commentator. I always screw that up for some reason. Commentator for the Vancouver Warriors, my good friend Brad Challoner will join us on the other side here on Extreme Threads Lacrosse Classified. We'll be right back on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network. Serving the business and sports community since 2018, Extreme Threads provides custom design apparels around the world. Specializing in lacrosse, they deliver exceptional quality and service, customizing box and field team apparel and uniforms. Extreme Threads offers free design work and takes the time to ensure you get exactly what you need for your team or club. Contact Extreme Threads at sales at extremethreads.ca for your custom apparel needs today. Hi, it's Dan Dawson from the San Diego Seal. You're listening to Lacrosse Classified on Lax All Stars. Welcome back to Extreme Threads Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All Stars Podcast Network. Speaking of Extreme Threads, I know they were at the BC High School Field Lacrosse Championships battling through the elements. I know there was snow like on the Thursday and the Friday, but they kept it going. I never did find out. Who won the championship? We'll have to do that uh, before we get out of here. But uh, big thanks to Extreme Threads, our title sponsor here on the program. They make tons of stuff, pennies, jerseys, jackets, swag, hats. Uh, They got it all. Just check them out at ExtremeThreads.ca. Sign your team up for an apparel package. Mention my name. Get free stuff. Follow them on social media at Extreme Threads. Do it. All right, uh, joining us now on the podcast, it's the Vancouver Warriors analyst. He prefers to go by analyst, Evan Sheminar. It's my good buddy, Brad Challoner. Chowie, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, fellas. Evan, thanks for uh, stepping away from the snow for a while. Jumbo, thanks for stepping away from The Bachelor for a couple hours. <laughs> oh, I knew you were going <laughs> to throw me under the bus when I told you that last night. I never should have done that. Uh, <laughs> never, big finale, ever, ever. Big finale tonight, uh, by the way, and still a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, my man Chris Peterson, I think that's his name, the host, he says this is going to be the most dramatic finale in bachelor history so uh maybe if you've never watched the show tune in tonight and uh you can get hooked just like Jeez. i did you and tyson it's chris, Harris, it's chris harrison i've been told oh there you go there you go i've been told i wouldn't know from watching yeah, i've been told yeah okay well the fact that you know the name and that you're sitting in a studio by yourself uh, just revealed some answers there, uh, quite frankly. Bradley, um, your Warriors, uh, what's going on with them this weekend? They got uh, the New England Black Wolves coming to town. The question will be, will Callum Crawford be in the lineup or not? Probably not. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I know we're a couple of days away from getting that finalized, but I just don't see how 
he could be in the lineup and, and have the league get away from this sort of unscathed and not look uh, like they're like they're making a Mickey Mouse call. So I think the league's going to do the right thing here. It may not be six, it may be three or four, but I don't think we see Callum Crawford. I think we we see the debut of uh, of Joey Rez, which is a which is a pretty fantastic storyline in itself. The way that that guy can can pull the trigger. So either way. You know, Vancouver Warriors aren't going to change their game plan based on one one or two lacrosse players in and out of the lineup. But uh, a rare Eastern team coming in uh, mm-hmm. to Rogers Arena. We're going to get a few of these over the next uh, month of the season. We got Toronto, Philly, and New England in the final four home games here to to wrap things up. So I get excited when an Eastern team comes into Vancouver. As I mentioned, you know, it obviously doesn't happen a ton. I don't think we've seen New England in in a couple years here. So it's always nice to see different jerseys and, and different star players roll through town. But you know, Vancouver Warriors need to get their game plan back on track and uh, and continue the playoff hunt here. Well, and that's exactly it. This is when a team's you know struggling throughout the year. You get these opportunities where a their star player's not going to be there. B the on um, probably the longest travel schedule that they'll have the entire season. And you're tied with Colorado in the in the standings. Who, to be frankly honest, is really struggling hard. This is the opportunity for the Warriors to finally get the foot up in that playoff spot. Yeah, it really is. And Colorado's got a tough task this weekend. They're they're playing against the Calgary Roughnecks, who are playing fantastic lacrosse right now. And yeah, you're right. I, I've never been on that uh, that travel Jumbo has. Oh. I think it is the most nightmare travel schedule from Uncasville, Connecticut. I know a lot of guys aren't living there, obviously, but you know, from the Eastern Seaboard uh, to Vancouver, that's not tough. So. A golden opportunity here for the Warriors, who haven't been at home in a month, so they're they're chomping at the bit to get back inside Rogers Arena. Um, you know they they want to they want to make that a tough place to play, and the, the boys are stoked to not have to head out on the road this weekend. It's been a funky couple bye weeks here for the Vancouver Warriors, so yeah, if there was a not a better time I could imagine than a New England team that may or may not look completely different, uh, a brutal travel schedule, and, and a tough weekend for the Colorado Mammoth. So. Definitely uh, looking at it like a playoff game this weekend for Vancouver. Speaking with Vancouver Warriors analyst Brad Challoner, I'm going to ask you two questions at once here, so stay with me, Brad. Uh, most teams like to do some sort of promotion when it's St. Patrick's Day, so what do the Warriors have going on? Tell me that, and then tell me who's going to start in goal this weekend. Ooh, the famous jumbo two questions in one. I like it. Um Question number one, promotionally, they've got uh, 25 bucks this weekend, gets you in the door and gets you a green St. Patrick's Day-themed Warriors T-shirt. Um, I don't believe they're going with, with any sort of themed jerseys, which I'm not really a fan of anyways. I've seen a few of the St. Patrick's Day jerseys that have been rolled out. Have you seen San Diego's, though? Yeah, and I think when you're a brand-new team that really wants to cement the purple and gold into your fan base, all of a sudden, you know, your fifth home game you're coming out with mm. with the different jersey. Mm. I think that's confusing. I think that's probably why Vancouver doesn't do that this weekend. They want to get people to, to recognize that, that black, white, and gold are are the colors that this team's going to represent. And I think you, you throw in a wrench with a green jersey. I think it just kind of confuses things. It's St. Patrick's Day. What's to be confused about? Keep it on the fans in the stands. Don't change the jerseys on the players on the floor. Well, put on maybe some green well, gloves maybe, or a maybe, helmet maybe or maybe something. A sticker. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe a gentle nod, like, you know, green shooting strings and a couple of the wands or something. $5 or, or green a beer. On the back of a helmet. $5 yeah. green yeah. beer, Barrett John. Green, green yeah. laces. Green laces. Let's see everybody looking like uh, Adrian Sorchetti. Well, there. I know they got the $5 but, uh, beers there at Rogers Arena. Are they going to go with the, the green $5 beer, maybe? I would imagine. I would imagine. I haven't talked and spoken to anybody at Rogers Arena so far this week. Okay. So I who, imagine the, the beers will be green and they will be flowing. Who starts in goal? I'm going with EP61. Um, I think he probably should have started last weekend, too. I know Aaron Bold's been been going through a challenging time, obviously, off the floor this season, like we all know about. And I think the Vancouver Warriors wanted to, to get him a taste. And if anybody's going to be able to battle through something like that, it it is Aaron Bowles with the positive mindset that he has. And I think, you know, the opportunity to put him in net and, and try to forget about the world outside of lacrosse for, for 60 minutes. But I think it's been tough go for, for Aaron Bowles. And I think, you know, Eric Penny, they, they probably got to go back to him. The way that he's been playing absolutely lights out for the Vancouver Warriors. And, and yeah, I understand why they went back with Bowles this weekend. But I think you have to go back with ET61 at home with against the New England Blackwells. Coopers, let's do this here. Let's go to the trades that happened here at the deadline. 
First off, no deals for the Warriors. Not sure if that surprised you or not. And also, what's your take on all the deals coming out of Rochester and what really stood out to you? We'll start with, uh, start with Vancouver. No, not surprised that Dan Richardson didn't do anything. You know, his, his message from day one is that he's been left, with, uh, been left with empty cupboards. And they've made a commitment as an organization to try to reacquire some draft picks for down the road and try to replenish that way. So I think draft picks too valuable for the Vancouver Warriors to give up right now. And Dan went on record last week saying the only thing he was going to do was trade player for player, but nothing out there uh, that really made sense. And I, I think it was nice to see the, the Vancouver club be, be quiet this time. You know, if they want to really separate themselves from everything that this organization has been a part of in the past, well, deadline deals were always a big part of that. There was always something that the former regime did on on deadline day and that you know changes the makeup of your team this is a team that wants to focus together and and stay together as a group and and build that chemistry and the best way to do that is what they've been doing that's rolling out almost the exact same lineup night in night out and and not making any deals and telling the boys that we're confident in this group these are the guys we're going to go ahead with so brad i'm not surprised that dan didn't pull the trigger before you answer that second question and you mentioned you know he didn't want to give away any draft picks he would have done a player for player could he have not done a player for picks kind of deal? Like if if his goal is to acquire draft picks and stock the proverbial cupboards, why wouldn't he maybe move a couple of guys for some picks? I just don't know who you move out. You know, like everybody in that club is is playing such a role right now, and a lot of guys getting floor time. Like maybe you talk about a guy who – like a Dan Lomas who, who's kind of sitting on the sidelines right now, but you know, I don't know if a lot of teams are, are taking a swing at him because he's being scratched by, by Vancouver on a consistent mm. basis. I think they're really confident in this group that they have, and they want to let people know that. Um, Rochester, man, like I don't know what's going on there. Is it, it Could it possibly be Kurt trying to cripple? I don't know, maybe... I don't know. I have no, no because he's, he's crippling doing. his own roster so, if he does that. Say, yeah, yeah, he's crippling his own team, so he's not crippling a team that he's leaving behind. He's crippling the team that he's going. Yeah, I think. It, I mean, with. Evan and I discussed it, and I think he's really. I mean, it sucks for Rochester and Nighthawk fans right now, kind of with Kurt walking out the door and and you know crushing his team. Uh, but it, he's really doing it for the future and and for Halifax. So yeah, it's bad optics. I get it. It sucks for Rochester, but I, at the, on the other side, like I think it's he doesn't know that city anything, and he's doing what's best for him and and his team moving forward. Yeah, but you unload two veteran defenders, you know, a bit of bit of return there, but you let go of two veteran defenders, you know, which kind of you think is is looking like selling mode, but then you bring in Ryan Benesh, which is a buyer's deal to me. So I don't know, man. It's kind of. Kind of a wash there. Yeah, I know that. Kurt Styers is a is a general managing genius, so I guess we're gonna have to see how this plays out in a year or two. Uh, Evan, you got one more? Yeah, I mean we're going down the home stretch here, seven games to go. What do the Warriors have to do to get into that fourth playoff spot and maybe make a run deep in the playoffs? Well, I think the scheduling gods are kind of snickering at how this next few weeks is going to look like. They've got back-to-back home-and-home with the Colorado Mammoth next Friday and next Saturday. And that is really going to be the crux of the season right there. How how that series goes is probably going to determine which one of those two teams has a leg up into the postseason. Um, You know, the Warriors looked great in February. They didn't look so great last weekend or two weeks ago now in San Diego. They got off their game plan. They weren't playing as physical as we've seen them playing. And You know, they need their best players to be their best players every night if this team wants to be successful because they're not that deep. And that means Logan Schuss has to start finding the back of the net. You know, a lot of times you tell guys you shoot till you're hot. Well, Logan Schuss keeps shooting. Shooting is not an issue on the confidence side of Logan Schuss. It's it's having those balls fall, crashing and banging, getting inside the way he was doing a couple weeks ago when he was held scoreless for a couple games in a row and then exploded with an OT winner. Like, that's the kind of night they need from Logan Schuss night in, night out if, if they want to win some lacrosse games. And a lot of the other things they've been doing have been working pretty well. You know, they're swinging the ball around on offense. They're getting contributions from different guys. I think, you know, you probably have to commit to to Eric Penny at this point, depending on how the, how this weekend goes, and, and sort of ride the hot goaltender and, and, and get back to the systems on defense. That'll set them up for some success. 
success here. Yeah, Matt Beer is playing out of his mind this season as well as we speak with Brad Challenger. Last one here for you, Bradley, and I'll ask you another quick two-parter here because I know your brain can handle it. Who are your three goaltenders for Team Canada, and who is your captain for Team Canada coming in September? Dang, son. Go, go with the left fielders here. Talking Team Canada, three goaltenders. Well, I think I think Dylan Ward is your no-brainer. No matter how this this season's going for Colorado, I still think he's you know probably maybe the best in the business. Um, I think you have to look towards the future, and you bring Christian Del Bianco on that roster, whether he plays games or not. I think it's similar to like the hockey model where we see where there's always a younger goaltender mm-hmm. who's going to be the guy who starts four years from now. So I would go Dylan Ward. I would go Christian Del Bianco, and I might throw Nick Rose in there. Yeah, you got Rose, you got Kirk, you got Vince. Yeah, Vince, Vince a bit on the older end. Like if you want to give if you want to give him another chance at another gold medal, but well, why not give a guy like you know Team Canada has got a, a leg up in the goaltending against every country on earth. So you could pretty much grab any three Canadian goaltenders in the NLL and be sitting pretty good. But I think you got to look at what, what four years from now is going to do. So I'm going to go Dylan Ward, Christian Del Bianco, and Nick Rose. Captain? Captain. Well, is, is Dan Dawson going to be there? You tell me, captain? Brad. You're the he, analyst. He's captain Canada for me. Um, I'm no, gonna go, I don't think Dan gonna Dawson go, makes that team. No, I don't, I don't think Dan Dawson makes it either. I'm going to go... Uh, the feisty spark plug and Sean Evans. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to be one of the older players on the team. He's still an offensive leader. And, you know, I love to hear Sean Evans talk and, and represent Team Cannon in, in any interviews with that Peterborough accent he's got going on. So I'm going to go with the C on Evie, who's won absolutely everything there is to win in the game of lacrosse. And, you know, championships follow that man around. So. You know, if I'm if I'm Coach Clark and I'm looking to put the C on someone, let's go with 15. Could be Brody Merrill. Could be Brody Merrill if he makes that team. Uh, well, Brad, is Bro- yeah, well, yeah, Brody still got some game, but uh, is he in there? Do you start I think, moving? I think, you start, again, do you start I, looking for some younger? Brody younger Merrill. Play? Brody Merrill is on my team this year. Yeah, I think he's got another another run in him for sure. Uh, Bradley, we're short on time here. Hey, pal, I miss you, and uh, hopefully we're we're back in the booth come September, man. I'd, I'd love to call some some more lacrosse with you. Well, yeah, let's, it's going to be a busy summer out west. Minto Cup, Man Cup, and World Champions. Let's go! So, uh, let's yeah, hopefully go! A lot of lot of opportunity to uh, to get cozy again, buddy. I appreciate the time again, Evan. Thanks for uh, thanks for all you do for the sport, bud. And we'll we'll talk to you guys soon. All right, enjoy uh, freezing Vancouver for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's warming up in don't, Saskatchewan. I don't get to say that often. No, no, that it's, Saskatchewan it's, is actually warmer in Vancouver it's today. It's crazy. It goes from <laughs> minus 48, and all of a sudden we're the same temperature here on the West Coast. Uh, that was Brad Challoner. He is the color analyst for the Vancouver Warriors and a uh, good friend of mine. And the program, thanks to him for coming on. One more break to come here on Extreme Threads, Lacrosse Classified, and then... Evan, it's the sensation sweeping the nation. It's Stempy Tax. Who you got on the other side right here on the Lacrosse All-Stars Podcast Network. Associated Labels and Packaging is in the business of creating first impressions. They'll help you reflect your company values accurately by offering solutions that fit your product needs. With the latest in printing technology and over 35 years of experience, Associated Labels and Packaging is the perfect fit for your company to take your labels and packaging to the next level. Hey, this is Shane Jackson of the Georgia Swarm. You're listening to Lacrosse Class 5 Lax All-Stars. Growing the game one podcast at a time. Welcome back to Lacrosse Classified here on the Lax All-Stars Podcast Network. You heard it right there. Thanks to our friends at Associated Labels and Packaging. I know they were at a big trade show over the weekend. The big boss, Sean Ashworth, was there. They did something cool. They had a really cool-looking booth. Uh, check my Facebook. I shared a couple of photos. And then after the, the trade show was over, I guess they had the option to like camp out um, inside the arena, which is kind of neat. So um, check that out. And then if you need some labels or you need some packaging, go to associated-labels.com and use them for that because they're really good at their job. They create first impressions. You can find them at Associated LP, as in labels and packaging on social media as well. 
And I highly recommend you do that. All right, Evan. It's time for Stampede Tack and Western Wears. Who you got? And it's your complete source for boots. Check them out. A huge selection of cowboy and blundstone. My birthday's coming up, Evan. I, I heard from uh, a little birdie that I might be getting a pair of blundstones for my birthday. They're CSA approved Ooh. boots, and they ship Canada wide. Located in lovely Cloverdale since 1967. Shop online at Stampede Tack. CA, we're shopping online, is still shopping local. I've never had a pair of Blundstones. I hear they're really good. Sounds like I'm going to get a pair. All right, who you got, Evan? Update the fans one more time where we stand before we get into this. Well, somebody's got a two-game lead here, and we're just going to brag about this for a bit because, like I said, I'm 8-0 and over the last two weeks. Uh, I'm 41 and 20, 67 percent. You're at 39 and 22, 64 percent. That last week absolutely throttled you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It did, uh, but it's been a long time since I've had a chance to host. Who you got? I didn't expect wow. to be down two. I was kind of hoping for maybe a tie or even down one. I would have been okay with. I didn't really want to go one and three, and didn't expect you to go four and zero. Oh, but here we are. Well, here we are. I'll give you a break on one of them because had you known that Ryan Benash is getting traded, <laughs> right. I don't think you'd ever want to take in Colorado. And, in and life, so. if I knew that Adam Jones wasn't going to be playing for the Rock either, that might have swayed my decision in that contest as well. So, um, unfortunately, we didn't get that information before we recorded, and that's the way she goes on who you got. So, let's find out who you got. Uh, our first game, it's a Friday nighter. It's the 9-4 and four Swarm taking on the 2-8. and eight. Tough schedule for Rochester this week, Evan Schemenauer. 9-4 and four Swarm against the 2-8 and eight Nighthawks at Blue Cross Arena Friday night. Evan Schemenauer, who you got? Pretty simple here. You got a Rochester team that a quarter of their lineup is going to be brand new. A lot of young guys getting their first shot. They're going to need some time to work this out. This should be a pretty easy one for the Swarm. I will also take the Swarm, and uh, man, do I love picking second because uh, there's a couple of picks later on here in Who You Got where I think I'm just going to take the opposite of whatever you do to try and get back to level terms here. But for this game, I'm definitely going with you. Taking Georgia over Rochester on the road. Rochester has to play the very next night, and it's on the road. So it's a back-to-back -back for the Nighthawks, and they have to play their second game on the road at Toronto, who's coming off a loss to Calgary, back home, and probably a little salty, two and who knows, maybe nine Nighthawks taking on the seven and three Toronto Rock. Evan, who you got? Pretty simple. Once again, Rochester needs some time to figure this out. Uh, back to back's not going to help them. Take the Rock every day. Also taking Toronto in that one. So we both have the same picks. Georgia over Rochester, Toronto over Rochester. Third game up. It's a 6 p.m. Western time start here. It's Colorado 3-8 and eight, taking on the 6-6. Six and six. Calgary rough next. Colorado coming off a loss. Calgary coming off a win. At home in the rough house. Evan, who you got? Pretty simple here. Once again, like I said last week, I've got no face in the Colorado Mammoth offense to muster up enough to get a win. Take the Roughnecks every day on this one. Pretty simple indeed. Until I'm not picking Colorado again. I've put my faith in them the last two weeks here, Evan. Asking them to prove me, show me to believe in them and they've let me down the last two weeks so this will probably be the week they go all right jumbo screw you uh -oh. you pick calgary we're gonna win that's okay because you pick calgary too i'm gonna pick calgary as well so either way and I can't. Your, yeah and your power rankings you had the mammoths dead last this week i i did man i i just like philadelphia to me i know both teams lost and colorado has one more win but i just feel like at least philadelphia is close and to lose an overtime game against the best team in the league, compared to what Colorado did at home against an expansion team, I know they don't like using that word. They're tied for first place. But I just didn't feel like Colorado was close in that game. And, yeah, they get – I mean, I had the Riptide ranked dead last at 13th, just so you know, Evan. Uh, Thunderbirds came in at 12. 
Uh, but yeah, Colorado is is bottom of the standings, eleventh for me. Uh, Warriors are ahead. I mean, I almost Nighthawks could be in that conversation too right now. All right, three down. We all have the same picks. Three to go here, and now it starts to get a little interesting, Evan Sheminar. You are actually going to be working radio side in this game alongside the legend and Johnny Gertler uh, up in the broadcast booth. We're going to be rubbing shoulders up in the broadcast booth for this one. Buffalo at Saskatchewan. Bandits 10-3. and three. Rush 6-4. and four. Coming off the bye week. Evan, who you got? I had question marks next to this one in my game notes, and and it's it's tough. You know, you're it's in Saskatchewan, but Saskatchewan's coming off a of bye week. What did we say at the beginning of this program? How much trouble teams have with bye weeks? Uh, Buffalo has won every t- regular season game they've ever played at the Saskatel Center. Um, and I'm calling this on Buffalo radio, but I'm sitting there. It's like, but the rush have been coming on lately. They played their two best defensive games of the year in the last two. <sighs> Who you got? You know what? I, I told the guys at the SWAT practice yesterday who I was picking. I'm not going to change it. I'm taking the Bandits. <laughs> I am taking Saskatchewan, Evan. Again, I think this is a real opportunity. Saskatchewan starting to come on here now. The addition of Scott Campbell. They're at home. I think the bye week, this bye week came at a real good time for the rush. I'm not going to buy into this bye week nonsense that you're going to be rusty coming off a bye week. I think they're going to be rested. I think they're going to be motivated. And having Campbell in their lineup, I think, is going to be a huge addition to them. Plus, they give me a paycheck each week. Give me Saskatchewan. And one note for that one for the viewers on this. Saskatchewan does not follow daylight savings time. Mm. It'll be an hour difference from what you're used to watching. So we are now an hour later than the normal time. We're two hours behind Eastern. We're one hour ahead of the Pacific time zone. So keep that in mind. Good time fact right there, Evan. Uh, Saskatchewan's got it right. The farmers have figured it out. No daylight savings time in the prairies. Evan has Buffalo. I have Saskatchewan. You heard it here first, Rush Nation. Evan is a sellout. Um, let's move on. No response to that? Okay. Philadelphia at San Diego. So. Two and nine Philadelphia Wings all the way across the continent to Southern California to take on the six and four San Diego Seals, a battle of expansion teams. Philadelphia at San Diego. Evan Sheminar, who you got? Pretty simple here. You're crossing the continent. One team's uh, kind of starting to look to the next year. One still fighting to stay in first in the West. Take the Seals. Pretty simple pick. Give me San Diego as well. Uh, I thought about taking Philly here. I really did. And then I thought better of it, and I'm just not going to do it. I, I, I'm just not going to do it. So give me in San Diego. Um, I just think they're they're ahead of the curve, and they're at home. We're going to win this game. San Diego for me. Uh, final game here on Stampede Tax. Who you got? And this uh, this could be a tricky pick here because we do not know the status of one Callum Crawford quite yet. Um, records are pretty, you know, 7-4 and four for New England, 3-8 and eight for Vancouver. But as Brad Challoner just mentioned, like this is an opportunity. You mentioned it as well. If Vancouver wants to kind of seize that final playoff spot, a New England team that's got to go across the continent, Vancouver at home, relatively healthy here for the Warriors as well. Black Wolves at Warriors. St. Patty's Day. Evan, who you got? Definitely a tough one. I'm assuming Callum Crawford's not going to be there. I'm assuming he's going to get something. So he won't be there. Joey Rezateris is there, but he's still going to need time to adopt to that offense. Both teams on bye week, so that's not going to be an issue. The only thing that was holding me back on taking Vancouver when I was thinking about it is the Warriors are terrible at home. That's the one weird thing. I'm still going to take the Warriors. I just think the travel is going to hurt New England. Not having their leaders is going to hurt them. Vancouver's got more to play for in this game. 
Well, this was the game, Evan, that I just decided I am going to take the opposite of whatever you pick. Um, I didn't know where you were going to go with the Saskatchewan Buffalo game. Uh, but I just decided I am going to take the Black Wolves here because you took the Warriors. I think you can make a case for either team winning this game. And I'm going to take the Black Wolves. So, recapping here quickly, we both have the Swarm to beat the Nighthawks. We both have the Rock to beat the Nighthawks. We both have the Roughnecks to beat the Mammoth. You have the Bandits. I have the Rush. We both have the Seals to beat the Wings. You have the Warriors, and I have the Black Wolves. Here in week 14 of Stampede Tax, who you got? That is where we sit. And uh, not too many weeks left in the season now, Evan. You got that two-game lead, but uh, that could all change here with a rush and Black Wolves win this weekend. Uh, almost done here on Lacrosse Classified, Evan. A few more things. We mentioned you're going to be up in the broadcast booth with John Gertler, so that'll be exciting for you, I making am. your broadcast debut. A little, are you nervous? <laughs> you need any tips or advice? Uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, help you tie your tie-up uh, for the suit that you need to wear now? Or? Yeah, I mean, i got to dust the suit off. I don't really wear one at work much. Um, and uh, you know, I did study up on the broadcast Saturday night just to kind of see where John likes to talk, where he doesn't like to talk. I've talked with Steve Bermel. So I'm going to be prepared as I'm going to be, but it's my first. If you want to watch, it's on, or before you want to listen, you can't, can't exactly watch, it's on 550 Radio in Buffalo. Okay, so uh, you can do that, but I, I strongly encourage you to, to get on the BR live feed and watch uh, myself with Ryan Flaherty. Uh, my boy Tanner Fetch called the game on video on TV side on BR Live, and then maybe go back and, and listen to the broadcast. Maybe Gertley will send you a copy, and you can post that up uh, after the fact, Evan. Make sure you're watching BR Live. Know, you're, know where you're going there. Um, what else? You have been working on a document here for the expansion, potential expansion draft coming up. I know you've been trying to like plug in contracts and salaries, and you've been working on this document for a while. Tell me about this thing. Oh, this is the one that takes me the longest every for the last two years. And if you got to think about it this way, the NLL does not produce a list of contracts that you can go deal with. Uh, Marisa and Jamie has her copy, um, and I have my copy, and it's tough because the transactions wire doesn't even have all the contracts. But once you got all the contracts laid down, you can start to see who's a free agent, who's got a contract that's active, and now it's time to start looking at who is going to get protected and who is going to be available. And a few of us were having a discussion about this this past week, and there's going to be some big names out there. You know, Saskatchewan, Curtis Knight, Marty Dinsdale, probably not going to get protected. Uh, you could have Jeff Cornwall, Brett Mitski not protected. Thomas Hogarth. There's going to be some big... Yeah, Thomas Hogarth, I don't think is going to be protected Sean in Buffalo. Durston, unless they, yeah. Or they could go and not protect Corey Small. I mean, there's possibilities there. Uh, there's going to be, you know, Zed Williams. Does he get protected yeah. in Georgia? And... There's going to be some big names, once again, for these expansion teams to pick from. Well, the other thing that's going to be interesting when it all comes down to it is that, you know, both the teams coming into the league are Eastern teams. So do these teams pick Eastern players off of Western teams, or are they going to be willing to pick straight-up Western-based players to go play in the East because they're the best player available, or do they pick that player and then trade him back for picks or yeah. other players. Like it, it's going to be fascinating to watch because last time we had San Diego and we had Philadelphia, and it was like they made the deal, all right, San Diego's going to pick from the West, Philadelphia's going to pick from the East, and that's the way it's going to be. It's not going to be like that this time around. Both these teams are you know, located far East, and they're still going to have to pick two players off of each team. So... Uh, each team probably has one or two Eastern players on it. Even Vancouver has that. Um, it'll be real interesting to see how that draft goes down. And I really 
wish the league would would have some sort of live document where you could see players uh, contract status and, and their salaries and all that sort of stuff it make uh, your life a lot easier grand perot's life a lot easier i know that uh, marissa's as well and uh, you know guys like me and jenner and challoner and tyson and can't thank you enough for uh for the time that you spend putting that together because i know it's very time consuming and painstaking and but it's a valuable thing to have uh when you want to have a conversation about things like that uh one more thing to get in here before we get you on your way um myself eric penny and julian kolb did the uh the big swim for support race on friday night um we took a picture i do have a kind of a pirated video <laughs> that was taken of it um it's not for public consumption it's just not what it was about but it's a little keepsake that i have we took a nice picture in the pool and and the main thing is is that we raised over fifty three hundred dollars uh to go to to aaron and michelle for their battle uh with cancer for michelle and um i just want to send out a, a heartfelt thanks to to everybody who donated especially the the toronto rock who kind of matched uh the total just before the the race on friday um all the players and, and jamie dow kind of getting behind that so um to everybody who donated and that that's huge and thank you so much and to, to aaron and michelle uh we, i hope that can help in in some sort of way for uh for the fight of a lifetime uh for you guys so um that was a lot of a lot of fun and and you know kind of made made us feel good to to think then that we are doing something a, a little bit that that could help us and you can still contribute on uh aaron's own gofundme page i believe there were what twenty thousand dollars or something like that already My goodness. yeah i know it's yeah uh, it's so. impressive the way the the way the lacrosse community has has come together to to it's not surprising really it's 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 amazing to watch because it's not the first time something like this has happened and it won't be the last and it just doesn't really cease to surprise me to see see it happen but uh to see that kind of do- dollar figure is i mean it's amazing um what uh what people have done when when they see a cause that needs to to be addressed so oh one last thing before we get you on your way got a brand new rush hour podcast coming out uh later this week should drop thursday afternoon sometime uh before i head to saskatoon gonna have jeff shatler gonna have kyle rubish and gonna have scott campbell on uh the big rush hour podcast so make sure uh, you're checking out uh, my social media channels and the rushes as well for that Speaking of social media, make sure you are following along at the show is at Lax Klaus. Myself is at PXP for Sports. Evan is at Shem Lax. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast as well. iTunes, Google, SoundCloud, Stitcher. We're on Spotify now as well. I don't know if you knew that, Evan Schemenauer. I just found that out a couple of days. We're on Spotify now as well. So make sure you're subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we'll be back next Tuesday, every Tuesday, right here on Extreme Threads Lacrosse Classified. Big thanks to Christian Del Bianco and Brad Challoner, to you, the listener, for listening every single week here to Lacrosse Classified. We appreciate it. Make sure you support our sponsors as well to keep the show going. Extreme Threads, Associated Labels and Packaging, Pure Vital Labs, and Stampede Tack and Western Wear. For Evan Sheminar, I've been Jake Elliott for the fastest game on two feet and for the creator. Have a good one, everybody.